It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hey guys, Tyler here. Today for Comparative Mythology, we're going to talk about the similarities between the Adam and Eve story as told in the Bible versus what is being told in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Now, there are plenty and plenty of videos talking about the similarities between Gilgamesh as well as the flood story for the book of Genesis, but not many people talk about the similarities between this story and Adam and Eve. And so throughout the whole entire video, I'll try to make an argumentation why I think there's a lot of similarities between the two stories. Now, according to historical dating, we do know that the book of Genesis came out roughly around 1200 to 1400 BCE, while the Epic of Gilgamesh actually predates the book of Genesis, and it came out roughly around 2100 BCE, give or take. The modern day stone tablets that we do have for the Epic of Gilgamesh was first discovered by a person named George Smith. Now, according to legends, when he was first discipling the whole entire flood story, he got so excited that he took off his clothes and began yelling across the British Museum. Now, keep in mind that prior to this discovery, that a lot of people thought that the book of Genesis was the oldest book, but it was actually surprising back then because no one had heard about this story prior to this whole entire discovery. So the question then becomes, well, geez, Tyler, what are the exact similarities between Adam and Eve and the Epic of Gilgamesh? Now, for this video, we're going to stop and pause an audiobook of the reading for the Epic of Gilgamesh, and then I'll give my commentary on which part has inspiration or doesn't have inspiration. And Kidu sat before Shemot. The temple harlot uncovered her bosom. Whereupon did Enkidu forget the wilderness wherein he was begotten? So for the space of seven days and seven nights did Enkidu lie once again with the priestess and go into her, his member hard. Besides the fact that the love making in the story is uh, pretty graphic, I want to show you guys what exactly does Enkidu look like. This image right here is probably what Enkidu would have looked like back then. But as far as we can tell, there is no such worship of Enkidu during that time period. And so it seems as know that Enkidu is something that's exclusive in the story. And this ancient image right here is Enkidu making love to Samat. Uh, please YouTube, do not censor my video or shut down my channel for this image. What is so interesting in the Gilgamesh story is that Enkidu made love for seven days and seven nights. Because according to Genesis chapter 1, it says right here, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, Let there be a massive in the midst of the waters, and let it separate from the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separate the waters that were on the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let the dry lands appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that they were gathered together he called seas, and God saw that it was good, and God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation and plants, wielding seed and fruit trees, bearing fruit in which there are seas, and according to his kind, on its earth, and it was so. The earth brought vegetation, plants yielding seeds according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit when their own seed, each according to his kind, and God said it was good, and it was evening, and it was morning, the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heaven to separate the day from the night, and let them for be signs for seasons, and for days, and for years, and let them be light in the expanse of the heavens to give them life upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars. 
and God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give them light, the earth, the rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw it was good. And it was evening, and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters swan with swan of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the living expanse of the heaven. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that move, which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged board according to its kind. And God saw it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning the fifth day. Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have domination over the fists of the sea, and over the birds of the heaven, and every living creature that move on the earth. And God said, Behold, I will give you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with the sea and its fruit. You shall have them for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heaven, and to everything that creep on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good, and there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he has done, and rested on the seventh day from all his work that he has done. Now the main reason why we see the common steam about seven days and seven nights is largely because the ancient people back then thought that resting on the Sabbath is actually a good way to actually cleanse yourself after a long week of work. And so for every single time it's on the seventh day, that's why they began to start resting. And it's not just the book of Genesis where you see seven days and seven nights. You see this whole entire idea of seven days, seven nights throughout the remaining of the Bible. But uh, let's get back to the audiobook and see what he has to say next. And Kedu sat before Shemot. The temple harlot uncovered her bosom. Whereupon did Enkidu forget the wilderness wherein he was begotten? So for the space of seven days and seven nights did Enkidu lie once again with the priestess and go into her, his member hard. And then did Shemot the temple harlot speak thus unto Enkidu, When I behold you, O Enkidu, you are like unto a god. Why is it you wish to roam o'er the wilderness with the wild beasts? Come, let me carry you unto high walled Aruk, unto the temple sacred, dwelling place of Anu. Arise, O Enkidu, I shall lead you unto the temple Aana, dwelling place of Anu and of Ishtar. That is the abode of Gilgamesh, the all powerful. Him shall you embrace, and him shall you love, as you love yourself. Arise from the ground, Enkidu. Arise from the bed of shepherds. And Enkido heard her words and approved them as good. The counsel of the woman found favor in his heart. Whereupon Shamhat did apportion her raiment, so that she might clothe Enkidu therewith. She dressed herself with one part thereof, and did clothe Enkidu with the other part thereof. Then did the temple harlot take him by the hand, and lead him like a child unto the huts of some shepherds, unto the place of the sheepfolds. And the shepherds gathered about Enkidu. The shepherds marveled at the sight of Enkidu. How like unto Gilgamesh is this man, they did affirm. He is tall in stature and strong as a battlement. Surely was he begotten in the mountains. His strength is as mighty as a rock fallen from the heavens. Before Enkidu did the shepherds set food. They set bread before him, and wine did they set before him. But Enkidu did not eat nor drink for he knew not these things. Hitherto had he grazed on grass with the wild beasts and sucked the milk of the wild cattle. And Kidu stared at the bread. He stared at the wine. He knew not how to eat the bread. He knew not how to drink the wine. Then Shamat, the temple harlot, spoke thus unto Enkidu, Enkidu, taste of the bread, for it is the staff of life. Drink of the wine, for it is the custom of the land. And Enkidu ate of the bread until he was sated. He drank of the wine, seven goblets full did he quaff, until his spirits exulted. Glad was his heart, and cheerful was his countenance. Already, there's like a lot of different similarities between the Adam and Eve story and Gilgamesh by that small segment on the audiobook. Because first and foremost, the prostitute 
was actually sent there to Enkidu to basically tame him and to trick him to go to Gilgamesh. Now, within the whole entire case for the Book of Genesis, we do know that the snake was actually there to deceive Adam and Eve. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God has made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat from the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will surely not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took up his fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked. While both stories both have backstabbing in them, I would say that the main difference would be that one story was about lust and the other story was about shame because both Adam and Eve were both shame for being naked. Meanwhile, for the case of Enkidu and the prostitute, they had no sort of shame whatsoever when it came down to the lovemaking. The story also make a direct reference to Ishtar. Now this right here is an image of what Ishtar looked like back then. Now, according to Britannica, we do know that Ishtar, at least in the Akkadian, refers to the goddess of war and the goddess of fertility. What's also funny is that the same goddess is also known as Anana, and not just that though, but we also know, according to this database, that it's actually associated with Ashura too. So that means that there's actually a goddess of the Bible that predates the Bible. Now, there's actually a story that is called The Descent of Ishtar to the Underworld. And we do know, according to the story, that the goddess Ishtar or Ashura actually dies and basically rises up from the dead. And if you guys want to see more about this story, click right up here to see the video about that particular story. In other words, we have at least two biblical gods that died and rose from the dead way before Jesus Christ. We have Baal and we have Ashura that both died and resurrected from the dead. He had seen all. Tablet 2 And Kidu sat before Shemot. The temple harlot uncovered her bosom. Whereupon did Enkidu forget the wilderness wherein he was begotten? So for the space of seven days and seven nights did Enkidu lie once again with the priestess, and go in to her, his member hard. And then did Shamat the temple harlot speak thus unto Enkidu, When I behold you, O Enkidu, you are like unto a god. Why is it you wish to roam o'er the wilderness with the wild beasts? Come, let me carry you unto high walled Aruk, unto the temple sacred, dwelling place of Anu. Arise, O Enkidu, I shall lead you unto the temple Aana, dwelling place of Anu and of Ishtar. That is the abode of Gilgamesh, the all-powerful. Him shall you embrace, and him shall you love, as you love yourself. Arise from the ground, Enkidu, arise from the bed of shepherds. And Enkidu heard her words, and approved them as good. The counsel of the woman found favor in his heart. Whereupon Shamhat did apportion her raiment, so that she might clothe Enkidu therewith. She dressed herself with one part thereof, and did clothe Enkidu with the other part thereof. Then did the temple harlot take him by the hand, and lead him like a child unto the huts of some shepherds, unto the place of the sheepfolds. And the shepherds gathered about Enkidu. The shepherds marveled at the sight of Enkidu. How like unto Gilgamesh is this man, they did affirm. He is tall in stature, and strong as a battlement. Surely was he begotten in the mountains. His strength is as mighty as a rock fallen from the heavens. Before Enkidu did the shepherds set food. They set bread before him, and wine did they set before him. But Enkidu did not eat nor drink, 
for he knew not these things. Hitherto had he grazed on grass with the wild beasts and sucked the milk of the wild cattle. And Kidu stared at the bread. He stared at the wine. He knew not how to eat the bread. He knew not how to drink the wine. Then Shamat, the temple harlot, spoke thus unto Enkidu, Enkidu, taste of the bread, for it is the staff of life. Drink of the wine, for it is the custom of the land. And Enkidu ate of the bread until he was sated. He drank of the wine, seven goblets full did he quaff, until his spirits exulted. Glad was his heart, and cheerful was his countenance. Then did Enkidu groom his hair and anoint himself with oil. Thus did Enkidu become as a man. And it came to pass that Enkidu donned a garment and grasped a weapon, and was like unto a warrior. Whereupon did Enkidu take up his weapon to do battle with the wolves and the lions who harried the shepherds whilst they did sleep. The wolves did Enkidu rout, and the lions did he drive off. Then could the shepherds lie down in peace. They could slumber undisturbed, for Enkidu was their watchman he who remained awake in the night. And it befell that one day Enkidu did lift up his eyes and espy a man passing by, whereupon did Enkidu cry out to Shamat the temple harlot thus, Woman, fetch that man hither. Why has he come? I would know his intention. The temple harlot called out unto the man and uttered these words, O oh, sir, to which place do you hasten in this manner on your arduous journey? The traveller drew near and addressed Enkidu thus, to a wedding banquet do I hie myself. This is the custom of the people. The ceremonial platter shall I heap with plentiful tasty viands for the celebration. Then after the festivities, for Gilgamesh, king of high-walled Uruk, is parted the veil of the virgin bride. Unto Gilgamesh is the chaste girl first offered. The king shall know the wife before her husband. Gilgamesh will be the first to lie with the bride. This is ordained by divine decree. From the moment the birth cord of Gilgamesh was cut, this was destined for him. Upon hearing these words of the traveller, Enkidu's face grew pale with wrath, and thus did Enkidu speak, I shall travel unto high walled Uruk, unto the place where Gilgamesh the king does rule over the people, and there will I challenge him boldly. There shall I cry aloud in Uruk, I am the mightiest in the land. Look upon me and despair." And it came to pass that the twain journeyed unto Uruk. Enkidu walked in front, and the woman, Shamat, the temple harlot, walked behind him. They did enter into the great marketplace of the city, whereupon the multitudes thronged about Enkidu as he stopped in the street. Of Enkidu they exclaimed, How like unto Gilgamesh is he! Though shorter in height, he is more stalwart in appearance. He is the one who was begotten in the wilderness, who once suckled on the milk of wild beasts, and ate of the grass of the forest. Now, at last, for mighty Gilgamesh, like unto a god, has come an equal. In Arunk was the bridal bed made ready, fit for the goddess of weddings. And then there were the celebrations and merrymaking, and sacrifices offered unto the gods. Whereupon did Gilgamesh come to the nuptial house to delight in the virgin bride, to go in unto her. But this was not to be, for Enkidu did step forward in the gate and did block the passage of Gilgamesh. Enkidu would permit not Gilgamesh to enter therein. Then did Gilgamesh and Enkidu grapple, one against the other. Their anger was inflamed, and it burgeoned. Neither one would yield. Like wild bulls did they rage and snort. The stone walls did tremble, the doorposts did shatter, in fierce combat did they struggle one against the other. The stone walls did tremble, the doorposts did shatter, and then did Gilgamesh overcome Enkidu, and place his knee upon the fallen wild man. Thus was Enkidu vanquished. Whereupon the fury of Gilgamesh abated, the wrath of the king of Uruk was quelled. And then spoke Enkidu to Gilgamesh in this manner, There is none other like unto you. Indeed the mother who bore you, the great wild cow goddess Ninsun, exalted you above all other heroes. And the great god Enlil has destined for you kingship o'er the people, for none can withstand your might. And it came to pass that they embraced like brothers, and were as friends. When I heard that wrestling story for the first time, 
It reminds me so much about what happened in the book of Genesis between the God of the Bible and Jacob. That night, Jacob got up and he took his two wives, his two female servants, and eleven sons and crossed the ford of Jabuk. After he sent them across the stream, he sent over his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. One final similarity between the two stories are the ideas of the fall of man, because the way that Gilgamesh portrayed it is so different in comparison to Adam and Eve. And Kidu spoke unto Gilgamesh thus, My friend, I have had a dream. In my dream the great gods met in council together. The gods Anu, Enlil, Ea, and Shamash were assembled. Whereupon did Anu, lord of the gods, say unto Enlil, god of earth, wind, and air, By reason that Gilgamesh and Enkidu have killed the bull of heaven, and because they have slain Humbaba, guardian of the forest of cedars, one of the twain must die. Whereupon did Enlil make reply unto Anu in this manner, then Enkidu shall die, but Gilgamesh must not die. And then Shamash, the sun god, spoke unto the valorous Enlil, It was by my command that they smote the bull of heaven, and also Humbaba. Should now Enkidu perish, although innocent? At this Enlil was enraged, and said unto Shamash, It is you who are at fault. You did daily visit them, and walked about with them like a companion. This was my dream, my friend, and by this dream am I greatly distressed. And it came to pass that Enkidu was stricken, and he lay himself upon his bed. The tears flowed down his cheeks like unto rivers. Enkidu was heartsick. He said unto Gilgamesh, O oh, my brother, dear brother, the gods will take me from you. With the dead will I abide for all eternity. I shall cross the threshold of the netherworld, and never more set mine eyes upon my dear brother. Enkidu was overcome by a fever, and in his delirium he said unto the great door of cedar, as if it were a man, O door of cedar wood, stupid and insensate, you understand nothing. For you, over the space of twenty leagues, did I seek the finest timber. Then I perceived the most lofty and most magnificent of cedars. There was no tree to equal yours in all the land. Seventy-two cubits is your height, twenty-four cubits is your width, and one cubit is your thickness. Your hinge-pole, your ferules, and your pivots are unsurpassed. I created you, and carried you unto Nippur, and placed you in the sanctuary of the great god Enlil. Had I but known, O door of cedarwood, how you would requite me, and had I but known, O door of cedarwood, that this is how you would manifest your gratitude, I would have raised mine axe and cut you down. I would have lashed you unto a raft and floated you down the river to the temple of Shamash at Ebabara. I would have set you up in the doorway of the temple of Shamash, and there would I have placed the great lion-headed eagle god Anzu. This is because Shamash gave ear to my entreaty and, in time of danger, provided me with a weapon. O oh, door of cedarwood! I created you, and I set you up, and now I shall tear you down. May some future king who comes after me despise you and disdain you. May this king place you where men cannot observe you. Let him obliterate my name and inscribe his own name upon you, and then will the curse fall upon him and not upon me. And then did Enkidu tear out his hair and rend his garments. When Gilgamesh heard these words of Enkidu, his friend, tears came to his eyes and flowed down his face. And Gilgamesh said unto Enkidu, My friend, you who possessed understanding and good sense, do now proclaim all manner of blasphemy. Wherefore, my friend, does your heart utter all manner of sacrilege? Your dream was, in sooth, an important omen, but quite worrisome. This worry has set your lips to buzzing like flies. Though frightening, your dream is a significant portend. You must know the gods have decreed that the lot of the living is to grieve. Your dream ordains mourning for the one who survives. Now shall I pray unto the great gods. 
Unto Shamash, the sun god, will I offer words of supplication. I will beseech Anu, lord of the gods, on your behalf. Unto Enlil, the great counselor, will I beg deliverance for you. And for you shall I fashion a statue of gold beyond measure in your likeness. There is no quantity of silver, no quantity of gold, which may erase what Enlil has ordained. What Enlil has ordained cannot be annulled. My friend, it is the destiny of every man to die. What is unknowable is the hour of his death. At the first light of dawn, Enkidu raised his head and cried aloud unto Shamash. Beneath the rays of the sun, Enkidu wept tears of anguish and said, O oh, Shamash, I appeal unto you to spare my precious life. And as to that foul wretch of a hunter who found me naked and unsullied in the wilderness, and thereby did sunder me from a state of grace, may his traps always be empty, and his quarry always elude him. Make his prey always be meager, so that he will lose his livelihood. And after he had execrated the hunter to his heart's content, and Kidu did then resolve to curse Shamhat, the temple harlot, who had taken his innocence. And Kidu said, Hear me, woman, I shall now decree your fate. Your woes will never end, and shall last for all eternity. I will place the greatest of all curses upon you. Desolation shall overcome you forthwith. Never shall you know the love of a child, or the pleasures of a household. Never shall there be satisfaction of your desire. You shall not dwell in the company of women of good breeding. Your finest garments will be bestained by the vomit of drunkards, and your lover will prefer younger and more beauteous girls. He will treat you as a potter treats clay. Objects of beauty will you never acquire. No bright alabaster, no banquet table, heaped high with tasty comestibles to enjoy. No comfortable feather bed will you sleep upon, but only a crude bench of hardwood. The crossroads shall be your abode. Bare ruined fields will be wherein you slumber. The shadow of a broken wall shall be the place where you ply your trade. Briars and thorns will pierce your bare feet. Both drunk and sober will strike your cheek. Many will be the verdicts adjudicated against you. The roof of your shelter will leak from the rain, and the builder will not seal the leak thereof. The rabble in the street shall hurl curses and epithets after you as you stroll abroad. The owl will nest above your sleeping place, and a hearty feast shall never grace your table. You will be stripped of your purple finery and wear only soiled undergarments. By reason that you tainted me when I was pure and undefiled in the wilderness, do I now cast my curse upon you. Yea, I was pure and undefiled in the wilderness, and there you did seduce and corrupt me. When Shamash the sun god heard these words of Enkidu, he did call out to him from the heavens, O Enkidu, why curse you the temple harlot Shamhat? Bread fit for a god did she feed you, wine fit for a king did she pour for you. She did clothe you in splendid raiment, and for a comrade she did give unto you well-favored Gilgamesh. Now shall Gilgamesh, your friend and your brother, grant you to lie down upon a magnificent bed. Gilgamesh will have you rest upon a bed of honor near unto his left hand, and then shall the princes of the earth kiss your feet. The dwellers in Uruk will bewail and bemoan and lament your death. The pleasure-seeking people of Uruk will be overcome with woe. And after you are dead, Gilgamesh will let his hair grow long and matted, and will don the pelt of a lion, and will wander throughout the length and breadth of the wilderness in mourning. And Kidu gave ear to the words of glorious Shamash, and his wrathful heart was appeased, and his fury abated. Enkidu relented and said unto Shamhat, the temple harlot, Come, Shamhat, I ordain for you a different destiny. My mouth, which cursed you, shall now bless you instead. Kings, princes, and nobles shall be smitten with ardor for you. At two leagues removed from you shall a man comb out his locks in anticipation. At one league removed from you shall a man's loins tingle in anticipation. The man who embraces you shall not hesitate to undo his girdle and uncover his treasure. Upon you shall he bestow obsidian, lapis lazuli, and gold. Ear bangles and finger rings shall he bestow upon you. Ishtar, goddess of love and fertility, 
will cause you to know the man whose wealth is bountiful, and whose granaries are heaped to overflowing. For you shall this man forsake his wife, though she be the mother of seven of his children. And as Enkidu did lie in his sickbed, alone and forlorn, his spirit was troubled, and he had a dream. Whereupon it befell that Enkidu did relate his dream to Gilgamesh thus, My friend, I have had another dream. In my dream the firmament roared, and the earth rendered reply. Between heaven and earth did I stand. Then I perceived a man. Dark was his countenance, and fearsome it was. His aspect was like unto the great lion-headed eagle-god Anzu. His paws were the paws of a lion. His talons were the talons of an eagle. He grasped me by the hair, and prevailed over me. I smote him, but he sprang back like a gate. He struck me, and like unto a raft overturned me. Upon me, like a mighty wild bull, did he trample. He drenched my body with his slaver. I cried out unto you, Gilgamesh. I cried out, Succor me, my friend. But you answered not. You were affrighted, and you did not rescue me. Then the man touched me, and mine arms were transformed into the wings of a dove. And then he trussed me up, and led me down unto the house of darkness, the abode of Ereshkigal, queen of the netherworld. He led me down unto that dwelling place, from whence none who enters ever returns. Ay, the road wherefrom there can be no returning. Unto the house whose tenants are ever bereft of daylight. There dust is their sustenance, and mud is their food. In that place feathers are their garments like unto birds. Yea, there they view no light, but exist in darkness, and on the door and on the bolt lies a thick layer of grime. Upon all the house of darkness lay the stillness of death. When I did enter therein, I perceived the erstwhile monarchs of the earth, their crowns fallen to the dirt in humbled heaps. I saw those who once wore regal crowns, who of old reigned over vast lands, who once served roast meat and bread unto the gods Anu and Enlil, and once poured for them cool water from skins. In the house of darkness wherein I entered, I did behold all manner of priests, high priests and acolytes, purification priests and ecstatic priests, the priests who were the anointers of the great gods. I beheld Etana, king of Kish, who was carried unto heaven on the back of an eagle. I beheld Sumuquan, god of animals. And there did I behold the goddess Ereshkigal, queen of the netherworld. And before her squatted Beletsuri, scribe of the netherworld, reading from the tablet of destinies in which every man's fate is inscribed. Whereupon did the goddess Ereshkigal raise up her head and espy me, and say, Who has brought this man hither? I have endured all manner of travail and hardship with you, Gilgamesh. Remember me, my friend, and do not forget all that we have undergone together. And then did Gilgamesh utter these words unto Enkidu, My friend, you have had a portentous dream. You must know the gods have decreed that the lot of the living is to grieve. Your dream ordains mourning for the one who survives. Now shall I pray unto the great gods. Unto Shamash, the sun-god, will I offer words of supplication. I will beseech Anu, lord of the gods, on your behalf. Unto Enlil, the great counselor, will I beg deliverance for you. And for you shall I fashion a statue of gold beyond measure in your likeness. There is no quantity of silver, no quantity of gold, which may erase what Enlil has ordained. What Enlil has ordained cannot be annulled. My friend, it is the destiny of every man to die. What is unknowable is the hour of his death. And on the day Enkidu had his dream, was his strength depleted, and he grew weary. Enkidu lay upon his bed that day and that night. Enkidu lay upon his bed a second day. Enkidu was ill. Enkidu lay upon his bed a third day and a fourth day. Enkidu grew ever more ill. And Kidu lay upon his bed a fifth day and a sixth day. And Kidu lay upon his bed a seventh day and an eighth day and a ninth day and a tenth day. And Kidu's illness grew ever worse. And Kidu lay upon his bed an eleventh day and a twelfth day. And then did Enkidu cry out to Gilgamesh, My friend, the gods have cursed me, and I die in shame. 
no glory shall I have, unlike a warrior who falls in battle. I feared combat, so I must die in my bed. The soldier who dies in battle is blessed for his valor, but I shall not fall in battle, and so my name will never attain everlasting renown. And then did Gilgamesh see Enkidu breathe his last, and Gilgamesh wept for his friend. As you guys directly heard from the audiobook for the epic of Gilgamesh, the fall of man for the case of Enkidu was very tragic, largely because he got really sick and he put the blame on Gilgamesh and the prostitute on why he has such a fall for his whole entire lifetime. Now, what exactly is the biblical account when it comes down to the issue about the fall of man? Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and it hid from the Lord God among the tree of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl in your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put a minity between you and the woman, between your offsprings and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor you will give birth to children. Your desires will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife, and a fruit from the tree which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Curses is the ground because of you. Through painful troll you will eat food from it. For all your days of your life it will produce thorns and testes for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your bowel you will eat your food, until you run it to the ground. And since you were taken, for the dust you are, and to the dust you will return. What do you guys think about these parallels between the Adam and Eve story and the Epcot Gilgamesh? Tell me in the comment section down below, and as always, I'll see you guys in the next video. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. He's your only black friend, so he's your best black friend. I wouldn't trade him for another black friend. Because black friends are rare as you should be aware He smiles like Richard Pryor so just sit and stare It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler